Hello and welcome. Moss Adams is pleased that you've joined us for today's session, Key Internal Controls for Fraud Detection and Prevention. Before we begin, I'm going to play our housekeeping video. Welcome and thanks for joining. We're pleased to present our continuing professional education webcast series. Before we begin, please keep the following in mind. You can customize how you view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top right of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons that relate to a different aspect of our session. You can download a PDF of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget. You can ask questions by typing in the Q&A window and clicking Submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session offers one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy requirements. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of polling questions. To participate in the polls, please check the button next to your answer within the slide window and click Submit. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE Progress widget and download your CPE certificate. Don't worry if you can't download your CPE certificate today, we'll email you a copy in two weeks. If attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our Group CPE Attendance Sheet, available in our slide deck and handouts widget to receive credit. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. CPE credit can only be awarded to participants registered as themselves and isn't available for participants who view the on-demand version. This presentation is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. All right, and now that we have our housekeeping items out of the way, I will turn it over to today's presenters to get us going. Thank you, and good morning or afternoon, wherever you are in the world. I am a Chelsea Ritchie. I am a senior manager within our business consulting solutions group. Um, very nice to be with you all today. I specialize in um, financial internal controls as well as policy and procedures. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Tammy. Great, thanks so much, Chelsea, and good to be here with everyone today. My name's Tammy Laura. I'm a senior manager in our business consulting services group as well. I focus on organizational efficiency and effectiveness work, and that uh, certainly relates to internal controls. I am also a certified fraud examiner, and I work with a lot of our clients to help set up their fraud prevention and detection programs. And we are very excited to be with all of you today. Our goal after today's session is that you'll be able to conduct a risk assessment um, of your existing internal controls to really understand where you might have weaknesses or gaps. Look at your existing policies and procedures. We'll talk about those quite a bit today. As you already heard from Chelsea, it's an area that she's very passionate about, and they really are a foundational control to help ensure that expectations are really clear and to promote continuity if employees' roles are changing, which we're seeing quite a bit of. We'll also look at segregation of duties throughout your operations and transactions. So really understanding where there are risks in segregation of duties, especially again, if you're struggling with vacancies or turnover. And then finally, you'll be able to monitor and test your internal controls on a continuous basis to make sure that they are designed properly and adhered to by employees at all levels. To accomplish these learning objectives, we're gonna go through these elements today. So we're gonna talk about why internal controls matter right now. Spoiler alert, it's a really critical time to stop and think about internal controls since you've been through a period of significant change, at least most of our clients have. So we wanna be able to help you stop and take a look at your internal control structure and see what did or did not change over the last few years with COVID and the number of um, downstream effects of COVID that it's had on the workforce supply chain and other elements. 
We'll also talk about how to conduct a risk assessment, review five key internal control areas, and talk about ways to monitor and test your controls. Let's get started. So why do internal control, controls matter right now? You know, when I, when I think about this, gosh, there's so many different answers that come you know, about. But I think with the ever-changing landscape that we're all going through in the workforce, Place environment right now, it's, it's, you know, more important than ever. Um, you know, with internal controls, we're really trying to hope that we're going to mitigate that risk exposure. Um, not only the risk exposure, but the overall financial loss to our organization, as well as like Tammy mentioned before, um, you know, that fraud and waste value as well. So, um, you know, overall having your assets safeguarded and really having effective internal controls can make sure that you have, you know, a healthy environment um, in your workforce. So here are a couple shifts in the, um, you know, internal control workplace that we see quite frequently. Um, you know, these are probably things that we've all seen once or twice in our career. Um, you know, I think the most important thing to remember is that we will always be having a risk landscape that is constantly in a change of flux. Um, you know, and I think once you address a risk, you can't just put it to the wayside. You know, it's never a one and done job, and it really requires constant vigilance to um, keep an organization safe and then also driving that value as well especially when you're seeing these um, shifts that, you know, every organization is going to have at one time or another. I was looking at a Wall Street Journal article the other day with about emerging technologies. And, um, you know, they were talking about how wonderful, you know, all these different new technologies are in um, the workplace and how, it, you know, it's really changing our work environment. And I thought, with that um, comes the consequence of making sure that our internal controls are in place. Um, you know, and I think it's important control environments, you know, may not be equipped with all of these new emerging technologies and different shifts to really respond to the landscape that they operate in. Um, and, you know, so what, what do we see with that? Uh, responses can be too rigid, um, you know, reactive and just overall inefficient. Um, and, you know, I think as a disclaimer, uh, you will hear, I think, you know, absolute preparedness is not attainable. Um, and so just knowing that is so important. And, you know, but if we rethink what controls um, can be and should be used in both today and tomorrow um, and develop a future um, of control strategy, to help inform us of relevant trends um, into this ever-changing business environment. That is the key and that is the overall, you know, theme that you'll hear both me and Tammy talk about today. So, you know, with these shifts, you know, we always think, oh gosh, organizational change, um, what are the outcomes? And I think it's important that, you know, these are things that will happen and these outcomes don't have to be your organization's outcomes if you have appropriate, um, you know, training and internal controls within the place. Great. So we're going to talk a little bit more about just what we are seeing in the marketplace. So as Chelsea just went over, a lot has changed over the last several years. We've certainly seen that with all of our clients as well as our own organization. And so here we wanna highlight some of the ways that we're seeing these changes really manifest in the marketplace. And some of these are for better and some of these are for worse, right? It's always that balancing act of you have an advantage, but then there's a potential disadvantage if there's not the right training or um, deliberate intention behind implementing a change. With the influx of remote and hybrid work, we have seen a lot of organizations rethinking their processes, especially if those processes pre-COVID were manual or paper-based. 
Increasing automation is a very powerful way to enhance efficiency in processes, something that I am very passionate about. But during these transitions, we also need to think about the internal controls that exist within the processes, including things like documentation of approvals and system access levels, which Chelsea was also just referencing. It can be so exciting to reduce a process from three weeks down to three days, but we also wanna make sure that you're thinking through that lens of internal controls and the implications of those shifts to your internal control environment. We have also seen a lot of people's roles evolving due to labor shortages, promotions, and persistent vacancies. And that then means that system access levels and authority are being updated pretty often. So when that increase in permission occurs for an employee that's taking on additional responsibilities, we also wanna go back and see what permissions they already had and that might need to be revoked to make sure that segregation of duties is being followed. We see a lot of organizations right now living in that in-between of paper-based processes and implementing new systems, and therefore there's a lot of reliance on email to document approvals, and that can create a lot of additional labor to be able to keep track of all those emails, save the files as supporting documentation, it's certainly better than nothing, but it's it's certainly not the best internal control when you have a system option in, in lieu of those email documentation um, uh, supporting documents. We've also seen a lot of changes in the way that organization, organizations are purchasing items. And of course, actually getting items has been pretty difficult. We've seen a lot of long lead times for urgent items. Uh, this has been particularly impactful for a lot of facilities groups. Um, and we've also been seeing an increase in the number and the price tag of purchases that are made on key cards, as well as a lot of new vendor accounts being created to get supplies that are needed. So maybe you have a supplier that you usually use for something, but they are sold out. So you are then scrambling to try to figure out what are other suppliers that have this. So you just see a, a larger volume of those new vendor accounts being created as a result of that. Another big area of change relates to grants. Um, a lot of our public sector clients received ARPA or HERF dollars during the pandemic. So suddenly we needed to be able to make sure that we were properly accounting for and establishing reporting processes for grants, even if we didn't really have that many grants before. So while there was a lot of opportunities for additional grant funding, with that comes the need to make sure that we have strong policies, procedures, and controls over grant management and reporting. So again, we have this great opportunity and we also have this great responsibility that's associated with that. With so much change going on with personnel processes and systems, policies and procedures are more important now than ever. We've worked with so many organizations that have lost a key employee over the last several years, and then they suddenly just didn't know how to do things like process employee benefits or provide a grant report or track capital assets or how did this person end up pulling this report or doing this thing that is so important for us to be able to function as an organization. So we're really seeing folks transition to understanding the importance of documenting those processes and helping reduce reliance on sole contributors as well. So we want people that are backing up those positions so that if uh, Chelsea wins the lottery, because no one's gonna get hit by a bus, they're all gonna win the lottery, that we have someone else that's able to do that role. And finally, the last thing that we are seeing over the last several years is a shift in how fraud schemes are being perpetrated. Chelsea also is talking about this, that your risk landscape is constantly evolving and the fraudsters out there see that and they adapt accordingly. So we wanna also be thinking about those risks while we're designing our processes and controls. So the value of policies and procedures, um, you know, I think regardless of your size or your industry, um, every organization needs to establish a clear set of policies and procedures um, to help really guide your operations. Um, I, you know, I think it's important. We can say that and you can say, oh, it's because I have auditors that are on me, um, you know, whatever the case might be. But really, what is the purpose of policies and procedures? And I think the biggest thing is it helps set clear expectations. So putting in writing what is expected in terms of behaviors, actions, and processes in specific scenarios is so helpful, not only um, you know, to management, but also to the team that management supports. 
Um, I think, it, you know, policies and procedures, it's funny, I'll have, I have lots of clients that are like, I don't even want to begin to write these. Um, it just seems so complicated. And I think, um, you know, that is where we can kind of be led astray. Good policies and procedures should be really clear, um, easy to understand, um, you know, easy language for all readers. Um, kind of, you know, making it so that anybody that picks these up understands the organization's policy to a certain subject, as well as the procedure to, you know, make sure that they're in compliance with that policy. Policies and procedures also help to operate, you know, making sure that everyone is going to be operating according to the same principles and guidelines. Um, so, you know, having those consistent experiences and processes, both internally and externally, are so important, um, especially in internal control frameworks. And I think that they really help improve employee performance. Um, you know, and you might say, okay, Chelsea, yeah, that's what everyone says. How does that happen? And I think for starters, having consistent guidelines is just like, you know, being a parent. Having those consistent guidelines, um, you know, helps build, you know, overall trust among employees, which helps then drive that accountability. Um, I do want to say, though, that, you know, policies and procedures are not the end all be all as much as it breaks my heart. They are just part of the equation to having, you know, a healthy internal control framework. Um, you know, one thing, not every employee is going to understand or follow our policies and procedures. Um, you know, no matter how terrific policies and procedures are, um, you know, it's so important to drive, and I'll, I'll be talking about this later, but to driving back to employee training, um, having appropriate supervision, as well as making sure that the tone at the top, having ethics and compliance sprinkled in to make sure um, you know, that really policies and procedures are respected and well received. So with that, I think we're going to go into our first polling question. All right, thank you. So the first polling question is to what extent have organizational shifts in the last three years impacted your organization's internal control environment? And your options are significant changes, moderate changes, some changes or no changes. And the polling questions are located right on the slides that we're presenting. So if you can't see it, you can try hitting the F5 key to refresh your console. Perfect. And seeing okay. some of the results coming in, a lot of people right now are seeing moderate changes. And it's funny. So, you know, when the um, pandemic first started happening, everyone was like, oh my God, significant changes, significant changes. But I think as, you know, we're starting to kind of trickle away from that, we're seeing that there's still moderate changes, um, but not as significant as before. I think that lots of organizations are having to have that tough love and have had to make some hard decisions. Tammy, what are your thoughts? And I think a lot of organizations, especially over the last few months, have been returning to work or at least to a hybrid schedule. And so that also has a pretty big impact on the sense of change. Um, again, a benefit for many and a drawback for others, depending on your perspective. Um, and, and certainly the, there's pros and cons to being in person. We would have loved to have everyone in person for this presentation today, but um, it's just convenient that everyone is able to join virtually as well. And so as we see organizations returning to work and sort of normalizing what those changes were that took place during COVID, I think people are starting to see it as, okay, we have less change now. And so whereas it was significant change a couple of years ago, and now we're seeing, okay, we found our new normal. So we see this as moderate change. Right. All right, so moderate change, like we thought. Great. That sort of checks out with um, the clients that we've been working with, that sort of spectrum of, some to significant. And those of you, the 5% and no changes, uh, I wanna hear more, so. Your ways, yeah. Right? <laughs> All right, so now we're gonna talk about conducting a risk assessment. So here we're gonna talk about two different types of assessments, one that relates to your entire organization and then the other that relates to internal controls specifically. 
So first, we're going to start out by talking about enterprise risk management, which really focuses on evaluating and mitigating the risk that your organization is unable to achieve its goals and objectives. Within this framework, internal controls are a portion of the risk assessment process, but comprehensive risk management also looks at other areas like strategic personnel and operational risk. So for example, do we have a strategic plan? Are operations and resources aligned to be able to achieve our goals? How are we monitoring and evaluating progress towards those goals? Are we using our available resources efficiently and effectively? Again, two questions that are very near and dear to my heart. Um, and all of this really sets up the foundation to think about enterprise risk. And from there, you can assess more discrete areas like specific functional internal control design um, the efficacy of reporting as well as compliance. When we do an enterprise risk assessment, we end up looking at about 18 different categories of risk that spans things like strategy and planning, governance, management and leadership, organization structure and staffing, IT, fraud, of course, reputation and public perception, as well as things like internal controls, reporting and compliance. And the goal of these assessments is to provide a, a point in time look at where we have risks, identify and quantify each of those risks, and then develop and prioritize those risk mitigation strategies. This is a really useful tool to see how things like internal controls have an impact on operations. And based on operational risks, where we might want to look at functional internal controls. So again, we have this relationship between operations and internal controls, whether that's in a finance department or actually in service delivery as well. Uh, and Chelsea's gonna talk about another way to assess risks specifically with internal controls. Thanks, Tammy. So, you know, something that I do a lot for many different clients is internal control reviews. And so, you know, it really an internal control review is an assessment of the organization's internal control system. Um, you know, I usually look at this primarily on a financial level, um, but our, our group can look at it, you know, at a whole organization level as well. Um, so really what we're trying to do is determine if, you know, your, your internal controls are functioning properly um, as they're intended to do, and if they're able to manage risk from day-to-day -day operations. And so there's two different ways that um, our team can do this. Uh, so we can look at specific areas. So I have clients that, you know, will call me and say, I've had a, um, you know, we've just had a fraud scare in, let's just say, accounts payable. Um, we want a specific deep dive into our, how our internal controls are working with, within accounts payable. What caused um, this instance of fraud to actually happen? Where, where are we weak here? But I also have um, clients that come in and they want us to look at the whole gamut of financial, you know, controls. And so, um, and how, you know, you might wonder, say, I wonder what, which ones are important, which ones, um, are you really, really looking at all of them, Chelsea? And what I like to say is I like to look at the balance sheet and your income statement and say, okay, what is an inherently risky area? Um, and also what are material areas in your financial aspects? But, you know, typically we're looking at payroll, accounts payable, revenue and billings, these big areas um, that, you know, you, you might have some weaknesses in. What we look to, what I like to look at is really how are you evaluating these controls in business processes? So, you know, typical things that we're gonna wanna review in these areas are your policies and procedures, system access reports, um, you know, just getting an overall um, feel from teams, uh, you know, how, how are how are day-to-day -day operations really working? And once I get an understanding of that, that's when we come in and really perform that detailed internal control testing. So we want to make sure that, you know, what we're learning from your policies and procedures and, you know, talking to different team members is really what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and is this really something that's functioning adequately? Just because we do it for a day-to-day -day basis doesn't mean that this is, um, you know, the end-all be-all. And so sometimes it really is helpful to have a third party come in and say, okay, 
there is another way that we could do this that could, you know, kind of tighten us up a little bit in the internal control realm. Um, you know, and unlike an internal audit, which, you know, typically would be if I was going to do accounts payable, once again, I'm going to be doing a deep dive, you know, of many different samples. We're really going to be doing detailed sampling on specific um, controls. So it's, you know, kind of like a, I would say, like a sampler of a deep dive internal audit. Um, and, you know, I think the most important thing that comes out of these, and I really like to do them for the whole financial internal control um, system, is reports. And so what, you know, our team will provide you all is, you know, recommendations for improvements, a roadmap to how risky is a certain internal control that you have, what's the likelihood of risk that's going to happen in this area, and how can we fix that? And so I think that is the bread and butter that comes out of these. I think we have our next polling question. All right, yes. Yeah. So the second polling question is, how does your organization review its internal controls? And your options are internal audit, management reviews, policy and procedure updates, system reviews, other or unsure. And just a reminder that if you would like to receive CPE credit for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. We deliberately didn't say all of the above because we want to know what's the most common way that your organization is doing this. Um, and I think, you know, we serve as internal auditor for a lot of our clients. Um, and so we're always helping them look at their internal controls. So those two assessments that Chelsea and I just went over, the internal controls review and the enterprise risk assessment, we like to do those every three to five years because there's been change in the organization and we see evolving risk environments as a result of that. Um, Chelsea, what have you been seeing with some of your clients in this area? You know, I like to think that they're doing everything on of this course. list. Um, yeah. But, you know, I think typically we're seeing a lot of, you know, management reviews. So management's coming in. Um, making sure that they are really adhering to their policies and procedures. And then, you know, policy and procedure updates. I think this one is so critical. Um, and we see this a lot in every organization. And it, you know, comes out in many different facets. So it, we'll be doing an internal audit and it's like, oh, red flag, we need to update those policies and procedures. So I think, you know, if an organization says that they don't need policy and procedure updates, um, I, I, I wonder sometimes because I think that's yeah. a big And it's so easy for that to be the thing that it falls off because for it sure. can be time consuming. Yeah. Okay. Well, it looks like 40% of our audience has internal audit really taking the lead in terms of reviewing its internal controls, which is fantastic. We love to hear that. And then we're followed up by policy and procedure updates. There you go, Chelsea. We've got 20% yeah. star students on the line and then some management reviews. Okay, great. All right, so now we're gonna talk through some of the key internal control areas where we're seeing evolving risks. We're gonna talk about best practices for each of these areas and things to think about as you're assessing your own internal controls. And of course, Chelsea will get us started with her favorite topic, policies and procedures. Thanks, Tammy. So I really like this, um, you know, this graphic because I think it's so important to remember that policies and procedures are always going to be a living document. So, you know, earlier we talked about what policies are and what they aren't, um, but really how do you make sure they continue to be a living document? And, you know, time and time again, what we will see in our everyday practice, and I'm sure Tammy can attest to this as well, is you got your policies and procedures all updated, um, you know, five years ago, and my goodness, the auditors come back and they're they're still happy with them. And so we just kind of put them to the side. And then little do we know that our processes, staffing, everything is changing. Um, and so these documents kind of become stale and not, you know, sometimes um, can be 20 years stale. So I think it's really important to look, once we develop policies and procedures, I think the two 
really important ones when you first start your policies and procedures as a green and implementing. These are the main communication components of policies and procedures. And like I mentioned before, if your staff and management are not on the same level and agreements for policies and procedures, then they're never going to work. Because if management, you know, says, oh, this is how we're going to do it. And staff says there's no way that we can do it the way that management has, you know, written them down, they're going to continue to do it the way that they're you know, doing it on a day-to-day -day operations. So, you know, I think once, you know, management or whoever has come in and really developed those policies and procedures, it's so important for agreement on all different parties. Um, so testing employees' comprehension of this stuff. Does this make sense? Um, is this something that we can really implement on a day-to-day -day, um, aspect of our operations? And, you know, once everyone's in agreement, and I hope to goodness because no policy and procedure is right the first time. Um, so once those edits are in, that's when the implementation comes in. Um, so, you know, making sure that there's trainings on these policies and procedures. I think the most successful policy and procedures I've ever seen um, are when not only, you know, I'll come in and help develop, but sometimes they'll come in and ask me to help them implement. And they, you know, management will set aside um, you know, a section and a part of their day for me to come in and make sure that everyone is understanding of how are these policies and procedures going to work. Um, and, you know, so once, you know, we can get these two areas that agree in implementation, then really making sure we monitor and review these. So I like to say at least, you know, every two years, you need to look at these. Um, that's, you know, best practice, really industry-wide, um, across industry. And so, you know, I think it's important to say, stop and look at what, what is the policy and procedure saying? Does this still really work for us? Um, you know, what has changed in the past couple of years? And, you know, is there, is there something that we can do better? So making sure that you monitor and review and then once again, update. So this ever changing circle will really make sure that you're utilizing your policies and procedures to um, their fullest and making sure that everyone's, you know, using and agreeing with them. So the next one is segregation of duties. Um, so, you know, these are the four basic categories of segregation of duties that we like to see. So really this is a building, basic building block um, for any sustainable risk management and internal control system. So your policies and procedures are going to illustrate that in th those documents. Um, but how are you implementing these on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, so really the principle of segregation of duties is based on shared responsibilities of key processes um, that disperse the critical function of the process to more than one person or department. So, you know, without segregation um, or separation of these key processes, that's when you get, um, you know, the risk of fraud or error to occur. And they can just be overall, you know, far less manageable without these. Um, and, you know, I always like to think of the extreme um, scenario of segregation of duties. So imagine if um, the keys, lock, and code for a nuclear weapon system were all in the hands of one person. And I know that's dramatic. Um, but I think, you know, sometimes we need drama to really illustrate something, right? So, you know, what could the possibly be the income or impact of having that? So, you know, emotions, blackmail, um, I think fraud, overall human error, right? When you have one person doing it all, these are, you know, disinformation. These are possible risks that can come out of that. And really, they could be expensive one-sided risks, right? Um, that you know, if, if extreme cannot be corrected. And I know, you know, that's a really extreme, you know, scenario to think about, but unilateral actions will occur if segregation of duties are not implemented. Now, I know that, you know, some of you are probably saying, well, Chelsea, that's great. I would also love to have all four categories of cate uh, segregation of duties implemented in my finance department. Um, but we're a small shop, so how do you how do you think that we you know are going to go about this? And so I think it's really important to think what is your risk tolerance in a certain process. Um, 
there are mitigating controls for different areas. And I think that's that's important to think about. Um, and, you know, talking to us or, you know, thinking about, you know, talking to your auditors about, okay, I understand I have, I have segregation of duties issues here. Let's come up with ideas of how we can kind of work around this. So I think another really good area or really good department to lean on in this area is the IT department. Um, they can help us with those access controls, roles and responsibilities. They can provide us reports so that we can clearly see if there is a segregation of duty issue if somebody has, you know, the keys and lock and code for our nuclear weapon system all in one place. So really important aspects to think about. Another really important thing when we think about internal controls is safeguarding assets. And I think this is a really good illustration of, you know, how we how do we need to think about this area? Um, you know, thinking about those threats, the vulnerability, the overall, what the asset we're trying to protect, and then what's our risk tolerance. And in a perfect world, our risk tolerance is going to be covered by all three of these big circles. Um, so, you know, how do we do this? So, you know, I think it's pretty easy when we think about fixed assets. So, you know, our inventories, our capital assets. How do we go ahead, go ahead and safeguard those? You know, I think about physical storage and barriers, um, gates, asset tracking, having barcodes on our assets, surveillance cameras, um, alarms, access control systems, security lighting. These are, you know, basic ways that we can safeguard assets for our organization. But I think it's also important to remember that, you know, not all um, assets are fixed assets like cash. So think about those writing, signing, mailing checks. How do we go about those? How are we going to make sure that, um, you know, those are properly segregated, um, ordering, paying, receiving materials for our organization, handling cash, recording the cash. I think that one is usually a give me. That's a big one that people want to look at all the time. Um, accepting orders, who's going to accept them, who's going to fulfill those orders, and then invoice the orders. So, um, you know, these are all different aspects. You know, so regardless if we're talking fixed assets or, you know, non-fixed assets, I think there's, you know, some basics overall that we can think about when safeguarding assets. And so one of them being accounting for those assets at least annually. Um, and, you know, depending on your risk tolerance in certain areas, hopefully it's going to be kind of more for some than others. Um, but, you know, how do we do that? You know, looking at what's happening with our assets during the audit. Hey, it's not a great time, um, but it is sometimes the only time we have. So that would be a really important aspect. Year in counts. Um, and, you know, one, I... I have clients groan with me because they say, oh yeah, Chelsea, in your perfect world, but having those spot checks, having certain individuals come at certain times for spot checks is so important in different departments. And it really helps kind of, um, you know, overall teams have that sense of, okay, you know, at any time someone can come in and really audit at what numbers we have. Another really important, um, you know, tool to have in your chest for safeguarding assets is maintaining check-in and check-out logs. Super easy to do, um, especially for assets that are used by multiple people. This is an easy technique. You can see who's touching them and who's not touching the assets. And then I think another really easy one is inspecting assets, um, especially those of being fixed. So, you know, tools or heavy machinery, um, vehicles. You know, we want to make sure that we're looking at those, you know, at some point in time to make sure that they're not damaged or have gone, you know, missing, which sometimes can happen. Um, so with that, Tammy. Ah, thanks, Chelsea. I'm going to talk about authorizations and approvals, the internal control that everyone loves to hate. Um, and people do kind of tend to hate some authorizations and approvals when they are presented as overly burdensome. Um, a lot of times we'll see that authorizations and approvals are the driver for people trying to work around your policies and procedures. 
So we hear things like, oh, it takes too long for me to go through this process. Uh, maybe it's a purchase order process. I'm just going to break up this transaction into two separate purchases on my key card, right? I'm sure no one on the call has ever heard that before. The reality is that yes, Additional approvals take additional time and they do slow down your process, but more importantly, they are a safeguard for your organization and for every single person who is an employee. So if employees are following the appropriate processes, then there's an opportunity for those in the approval chain to make sure that the transaction is appropriate, they can question anything that might seem off, and protect that employee from claims that they're doing something inappropriately or inaccurately. One area that a lot of our clients end up getting stuck on is defining the right approval authority limits by level. This is a pretty subjective um, decision. It can also have a huge impact on the pace of your organization. We've seen situations where everything over $5,000 has to go to the board for approval, which definitely presents a hardship and requires a lot of upfront planning by staff, not to mention some potentially um, lengthy board meetings. And then on the flip side, we've seen department heads with signature authority of up to half a million dollars. And we might have questioned the appropriateness of that signature authority. Ultimately, every organization is different and they're likely to have different approval and authority limits. The key here is to think about your risk tolerance, the size of your organization, the other internal controls that are in place, and balance the need for approvals with process efficiency. So whatever your tolerance, the approvals and signature authority, again, should be documented in your policies and procedures and ideally built into your system environment wherever possible. And that can really increase the efficiency of getting those necessary approvals completed if it's as easy as going in, taking a look at something and clicking approve. The other thing to consider with approvals is what internal controls are in place to make sure that a transaction <clears throat> is not processed without those relevant approvals. These days, things tend to be a little bit tighter with those electronic approvals and systems, but inevitably in the audits that Chelsea and I do, we come across contracts and invoices without that right level of approval. And that's a big risk, both for your employees that are actually pushing those transactions through, as well as the potential risk of fraudulent transactions. So the takeaways here is define your authority and approval levels based on your specific organization, document them, make sure the right people are in that approval chain to ask those questions and make sure that there are controls in place to prevent a transaction from moving forward without getting all of these approvals first. The last internal control that we're gonna talk about is internal audit. Internal audits can serve as both a preventive and detective control for fraud. So if you have an internal audit function, employees are suddenly aware that there are going to be regular checks on how they're following policies and procedures, and that alone can deter people from deviating from your expected processes. What I always like to talk about here is that we're increasing the perception of detection. If people think they're going to get caught doing something wrong, they're far less likely to do it. Perfect example here is you're driving on a road, you're going 80 miles an hour, speed limit is 65, you see a car on the side of the highway. Are you gonna slow down? You're probably gonna slow down. Maybe it's just someone that pulled over, but you're still probably gonna slow down because you don't actually wanna get a ticket. So again, we're just increasing that perception of detection. Hey, someone's there. Hey, someone's looking out. I better make sure that I'm following the policies and the expectations for myself. Internal audits can look at the effectiveness of internal control design and, of course, the degree to which employees are complying with your policies and procedures. This helps provide a review of potential gaps or deficiencies within your internal control envi environment over a specific area, um, just like Chelsea had been talking about in the internal control review section. We're seeing a lot of internal audits focus on areas like payroll, grants management, contract management, purchasing, and asset management. Again, this varies based on the specific risks within your organization, but those are general themes that have been coming up in this post-pandemic world. I think that we're actually in the, in the green light to be able to say post-pandemic world now. Um, and of course, one finding that almost always comes up when we're doing these internal audits is again, our policies and procedures are outdated. They're not reflective of our current practices. They're not reflective of our current systems. 
or our job responsibilities. And so that's always something that we're really um, making sure that we're addressing in these internal audits. Again, the purpose here is to look at where you have gaps and help you develop recommendations to implement that will improve those gaps. A good internal audit is going to be recommendation focused. It'll clearly explain why your existing processes create ongoing risk to the organization and therefore need to be addressed. So just make sure that you are making those changes to promote that strong internal control environment. I think we've got our third polling question now. Yes, yeah, so the third one is which internal control discussed could use an opportunity for improvement? And your options are segregation of duties, policies and procedures, safeguarded assets, or authorization of approvals. I think we know what Chelsea would say, which is probably. Well, you know, I think it's. Yeah, and I think it's really important to say that, okay, if you say policies and procedures, it's kind of like an all of the above, right? Because yeah. those different aspects of segregation of duties, safeguarding assets, authorization of approvals, those are huge things. I mean, like Tammy, you mentioned, I hear time and time again, my procurement thresholds are off base. Can you please help right. us, you know, with different authorization approvals? So I think that's a big one, but I see it a lot within your policies and procedures. Yeah. Okay. All right. Looks like about half folks agree with you. We've got 50% saying policies and procedures, um, as well as segregation of duties and authorizations. Very cool. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, so, you know, we've talked about why internal controls matter. Um, why the heck? is Tammy and myself talking to you about this subject. Um, we also kind of touched on, you know, some of those key internal control areas. So now you're probably thinking, well, how the heck do we monitor and test these internal controls? Um, and I think it's really important uh, to remember, you know, that you don't have to do it. Don't be overwhelmed. It doesn't have to be all of them, but really thinking about those critical internal controls to your organization. Um, so thinking about some tools, that we can use. Um, so, you know, here are four really basic ones that, um, you know, you probably already can think of, but self-assessing is so important. Um, and, you know, in a perfect world, you're going to be doing all four of these. And it really is something that is doable in every organization. So really encouraging team members, management to review those approvals, those authorizations, um, you know, looking at reconciliations, those are so important. Like Tammy mentioned, internal audits, um, you know, and you don't have to have an, you know, an extensive internal audit for your entire um, year. But, you know, if there's certain areas that you would like to look at, I know that we have a couple clients that say, you know what, we think of two risky items a year that we would like to look at. And that's, that's all our budget can take and that's okay. But that's still a really healthy, you know, assessment to have. Um, you know, management review is really important. So spot checks, like I mentioned before, um, evaluating whether controls are functioning as intended. So having, you know, you looking at management, looking at the policy and procedure and really going down the list and seeing, is this really even what we do? Um, is this actually reflective day-to-day -day practice and whatnot? Another one that I kind of, we haven't touched on a lot of, and I think is really important for testing internal controls is those, is data analytics. Um, you know, so I, I think of a couple of these. One I really like to see clients do is cash flows. So looking at your overall cash flows on a month to month basis, and then also looking at that at a year to year basis. And when there is variance, having some sort of, um, you know, follow up investigation as to why those whys will really help bring out, um, you know, some, you know, internal controls that might be going awry or, you know, fraud or error that could be possibly happening. Another one that um, I, you know, recommend a lot is for individuals or organizations that use P cards. Um, so, you know, looking at split transactions in a certain day. So are we having employees that are trying to kind of go over their credit limit usage? And so they're, you know, splitting transactions or, 
you know, they'll buy one thing in one day and then the next day the same vendor. So those are really good, um, you know, just basic analytics to look at on, you know, a quarterly basis, a, um, you know, if you can month to month, but kind of will help you decipher if there's any, anything fishy going on. And most importantly, I always say this, so especially being a, um, you know, an ex external auditor from my past, you want to make sure that you're documenting these monitoring activities um, so that, you know, if anyone was to say, hey, you know, CFO, what are you doing with this? You can show that you really are putting in effort in monitoring and testing internal controls. Um, and I think it's, it's important to show to boards, um, you know, councils, whatever, but it, it's just documentation is such a key aspect of this. Great. Okay, so I'm going to talk about internal control implementation. So as your internal controls evolve, make sure again, we're, we're beating um, a dead horse here, but make sure you're updating your policies and procedures. We want employees to have a guide that they can use when they're performing their regular duties. Um, when you have those updates, make sure that they're sent out to employees. And depending on how different changes are within that policy or procedure, we also need to think about providing training to impacted employees so that they really understand the expectations and the new process. If we just send out the policy document, some employees might understand the changes and revise their processes, but we are far more likely to continue having inconsistencies and that requires rework and that is not efficient. Um, or worse, we can grant anyone who doesn't follow that new process an exception, which then means that we don't have the right accountability for this new process to really take effect. So we potentially created a worse process because now we might have two processes for the same type of transaction. And I'm sure we can all think of an example when a new process was implemented poorly, and I'm guessing that there was probably insufficient communication. So maybe you got an email, maybe you read the email, maybe you didn't read the email, um, but you certainly didn't get adequate training. And maybe there were no consequences for people who didn't take the time to be able to at least try to use that new process. These exact same concepts apply when we think about implementing or revising internal controls. If we want them to be effective, we have to provide the tools and the resources for employees to be able to adopt these new practices. And the last thing that we're going to talk about today is just internal control maintenance. So what we have here is sort of a schedule of what we do, what we recommend for you in terms of updating your internal controls and your policies and procedures. Um, Chelsea's already talked about this, but at the least we recommend a biennial review of everything to keep things up to date, prevent those major overhauls of policies. Um, so if you have a policy that you looked at three years ago, you're likely to have fewer changes than if that policy was from 30 years ago. And um, that actually happens a lot more often than you think. Um, Chelsea and I have both seen a lot of policies that are 20 or 30 years old and work with clients to help update them. But at that point, you're essentially starting from scratch a lot of times. When your key processes change, we should also be thinking about the internal control implications and the need to revise potential policies and procedures. And then finally, if you're implementing or having significant system changes take place, they absolutely require internal control updates, analysis, and updated documentation for employees. Uh, so if we have new tracking, approving, record keeping, and operational expectations, we need to make sure that we are putting all of that information down into writing and communicating it out. System implementations are exceptionally hard. And so making sure that people are really equipped to be able to understand the system, understand the approvals and the internal controls that are built into it will really help with that employee adoption. Now we have our final polling question. All right, thank you. So the last poll is how often do you review your internal controls? And your options are annually during the external audit, as needed, biannually, or you're supposed to review internal controls. And while you're responding to that, I do wanna let you know that if you want a copy of today's slides, uh, you can download them from the folder that says slide deck and handouts. And then we're also sending them out via email tomorrow, along with a recording of this webcast. 
great. I really like Thank what I'm you. seeing, Tammy. Yeah. I'm seeing a lot of as needed, which is great. And I think that that's pretty consistent um, with a lot of our clients. And the only the only potential risk with that is as needed, but then if we have an area that maybe didn't need that review for 10 years, then we maybe haven't looked at those for a while. Um, and so I think as needed is a great way to do it, um, perfectly reasonable. We just wanna make sure that we're getting that adequate coverage for our entire organization as well. Okay, we've only, we can give them a couple more minutes. I think we have, um, a couple seconds for some potential questions as well. We've got some great questions that have come in. Okay, all right, about 50% of you say as needed or 36% annually during your external audit. Great. All right, let's do some Q&A. Um, I saw one question that came in um, earlier in today's presentation about um, policies and procedures. Chelsea, what's the difference between a policy and a procedure as well as who is responsible for each one of those? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. So, you know, I think of a policy, whenever I write policies and procedures, I always write the procedure first. And then the policy should be the overarching, um, you know, rule, so to speak. So, you know, if we're talking, the policy is the threshold limits and the procedure is who has to approve those threshold limits. Um, I think, you know, I would say, so everyone should be um, accountable for both policies and procedures. I think, you know, I mentioned that before. Um, policy though most likely would be a management um, overall management decision um, but you know we're going to include our team members as well but then we're also going to have um, you know our procedures are going to be really heavily involved with our team because they're the ones that are actually you know helping us fulfill the the operation um, so like I said, I would write the procedure first, then the policy when doing policies and procedures, um, really heavily relying mostly on management for that policy and then the procedure for, um, you know, everybody. But I hope that helps answer that question. Great. All right, what else Amy, do, have here? do you want to, I'm trying to see, um, Um, P-card approvals are usually after the purchase. How do you best address this? Um, and I think Chelsea gave a great example of how to catch it after the fact um, with the data analytics. And so it's a matter of making sure that we're following up with those employees um, to make sure that they understand the policy, to hold them accountable to that policy, and to provide additional training when needed. Um, and sometimes there can also be some system controls in place where it might prevent that as well. So anything you would add to that, Chelsea? No, I think that that's good. I think, you know, really relying on data analytics, talking to your external auditors about that, as well as other consultants can help you, um, you know, come up with some ideas, but that will help you visually see um, when areas, you know, such as P cards are our main, you know, those P cards we always see. I think P cards is yeah. a main one that we're always looking at. Yeah. Great. Let's Pass it over to Amy to close us out. All right, thank you, Tammy and Chelsea for a really great presentation today. And for those of you that submitted questions, uh, we will do our best to follow up with you. And if you have further questions or comments, please reach out to us and we would be happy to continue this conversation. Uh, you can drop a note in the Q&A window or reach out to Tammy and Chelsea directly. Their contact information is in your console as well as in the slide deck. And if you met all CPE requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. A copy will be emailed within two weeks if you have difficulty downloading it now. And then finally, here's a link to a survey for today's presentation. And your feedback is definitely appreciated. And thank you for joining us. Take care, everyone.